Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series event for the 2020 2021 year. I'm Dean Gillian Lester, and I'm delighted to welcome you here for this, uh, this very special event. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, your cameras and microphones will remain disabled for the duration of this event, and, uh, and we are recording it for archival purposes. If you have a question during the Q&A portion of the program, you may submit uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. So, um, and we, we're gonna leave plenty of time for Q&A and we're, we welcome a lively discussion. Uh, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Andrew Yang back to Columbia. Andrew graduated in the class of 1999. Um, but before I give a more proper introduction, I wanna explain what might seem like an interesting conversation pairing today. It turns out that Professor Purdy and Andrew Yang go way back. Uh, they were lab partners in high school. So it's through the good fortune of their staying in touch through the years that uh, we've had the pleasure of Andrew's being with us today. And who knows, maybe they'll share a few stories of high school lab adventures today. I think for many of us, the name Andrew Yang uh, didn't become eponymous until 2008 when he launched his campaign for the president of the United States. But his career as an entrepreneur, corporate and nonprofit leader and advocate is really what earned him his name. Uh, many of you know that I like to talk about the changing nature of the legal career that Training as a lawyer can open doors and create unexpected opportunities across a career that spans phases and sectors. Uh, in this way, like many others, Andrew was ahead of his time. He practiced corporate law at Davis Polk. He launched a tech startup. He ran a test prep company. And he founded an innovative nonprofit to promote entrepreneurship and economic opportunity in American cities. And it was in this last role as CEO of Venture for America that Andrew garnered the attention of the Obama administration and began to hone his platform as a presidential candidate. Andrew's campaign initially was viewed as a long shot, but he defied the odds becoming a national contender and qualifying for seven of the eight early democratic debates. In the process, Americans across the country came to see his ingenuity, tenacity and outside the box thinking. He has single-handedly advanced a serious public dialogue about programs like universal basic income, and he's built a loyal following in the process. Of course, Columbia can't take a position on any political contest, but I hope Andrew will allow us all of, all of us at the law school, at least for today, to be honorary members of the Yang Gang. It's my great pleasure to welcome Andrew Yang and Professor Jed Purdy. Thanks, thanks Dean Lester. Um, and thanks, Andrew, so much for coming to spend some time with us. It's, it's really nice to be in your presence again, in a way, even in this strange way. I, I, I know back in high school, Jed, you were like, this guy is going to run for president someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a joke, because I was not the person anyone would have thought of in that regard. I think if I had run for a student body president at our high school, I would have gotten approximately zero votes. <laughs> You were, there are people who are always getting ready for, to run for something, even at that time in life. And that wasn't you at all, as you were not, you were not self-serious um, and you were not uh, super cautious and you said what came into your mind and you were funny and loose and absurd. Uh, and um, all of those qualities sort of became part of your adult personality and carried through, I think, in some ways into the um, persona around your campaign. There was a very authentic persona. One of the things I enjoyed about watching you run is that it was so clearly you at every point. That's not a question. It's just a, a <laughs> style comment. Um, I didn't have much of a choice, Jed, because uh, I couldn't out politician the politicians. And so if I was looking for a way to compete, uh, it turned out when I acted more like myself, uh, we ended up faring better. And so being practical, I was like, all right, <laughs> what else can I do? <laughs> what else can I do that will uh, uh, generate a couple million uh, clicks or hits or whatever it happens to be? 
Um, so necessity is the mother of invention on that side. Andrew, can I ask a little about the signature uh, policy of your campaign? Um, if, if people know one thing about Andrew Yang, it's UBI, Universal Basic Income. Really, you were um, using that as a keystone to a larger conversation about making technological change work for people rather than exclusively for profit. When you talked about putting humanity first, um, that was sort of the idea. And in the months since you ended your campaign, COVID has changed the world, right, in a bunch of ways, including just the things you were talking about. Like it turns out people's incomes are very vulnerable. It turns out the Amazon empire is growing more extensive every week and month. How are you thinking now about the future of making technology work for humanity in, in COVID and hopefully after COVID? Everything I was concerned about has sped up because of COVID. Uh, and now the, the level of support for universal basic income is much higher than it was uh, when I was running, where the last poll that came out said 55% of Americans now believe in universal basic income. It's amazing. Forever. And 82% are for cash relief during the pandemic. Uh, so this is gaining energy, not losing it, because we can all look around and, and see what's happening, see that the airline attendants and rental car uh, clerks uh, and security guards and gym uh, employees and yoga instructors have all lost their jobs through no fault of their own. Um, and so how do you keep them afloat? How do you keep our economy afloat? How do you keep a uh, society running? And everything just comes back to, well, we should probably send money to folks. Uh, and we did it in April. Turns out it was great. And economists looked at it. There was a headline that I got some amusement out of, Jed. It said, uh, said that the enhanced benefits reduce the poverty rate. Um, like, like it was some kind of news flash. <laughs> it was like, well, made poverty go down by sending people money. It's like, yeah, that kind of would have worked at any point had you tried it. Um, so the, the energy around universal basic income is now higher than ever because people can see that uh, we're losing jobs uh, at uh, an unbelievable pace. And a lot of those jobs will not come back. We're investing in automation in many of these contexts that's going to permanently displace these workers. I'm just gonna call it three examples just for the folks here that came out in the headlines the last number of days. Uh, number one, Google said that they now have AI that can do the work of call centers. Um, so there are 2 million plus call center workers in the United States. Tyson Foods said that they're gonna replace meatpacking workers in their plant with robots. And Sam's Club just said that they're gonna have robot janitors clean all the, their locations. So those are three things that just came out in the last number of days that are all related to COVID, except for the Google thing would have happened anyway, but there two I think were COVID related. So how do you see the wave of energy around UBI relating to the bigger emergence in the democratic primaries and in the last four years, or the more general emergence of kind of redistributive calls in politics and concerns about economic concentration and power that's not accountable to people. I'm thinking about the Warren campaign with its emphasis on economic power as a democratic problem and about the Bernie campaign, of course. You were both part of and sort of distinct from that development. How, how did that feel from the inside? How do you stand in relation to those things? I could not believe that Bernie did not come out for universal basic income at any point. I was like, come on, Bernie. <laughs> like, um, Elizabeth Warren, I was a little bit less surprised, uh, but Bernie, I genuinely thought it's like, well, you know, what's the hold? Um, I think you're right where I was similarly aligned, but somewhat distinct. Um, and one, one of the things that mystified me was that there were folks who, in my mind, had very similar goals and agendas uh, who seem to um, try and find reasons why um, I might not be the right candidate or my proposals might not be the right solutions. Um, but it seemed to me like that they, they were taking some kind of reactive stance rather than looking at it being like, would this actually help move us in the, the same direction? Um, and it's one of the learnings I, I had, Jed, which is that there's a lot of um, coding and symbolism involved in politics that that's um, uh, 
unfortunately, it ends up um, pitting us against each other in ways that really would not make sense if you were to just sit down and say, okay, like what are the policy goals? How this impact X versus Y? Um, we, we become very tribal in our politics uh, and I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. If we talk a little more about that then, Andrew, um, I think one of the ways that you can bring rare essential information to all of us and to just about anyone is that in the campaign, you spoke to and listened to a lot more kinds of voters than many of us do in our lives. Um, you spent time outside everyone's ideological bubble. And what I really wanna know is what did you learn about how we misunderstand one another, how we get one another wrong in this political moment? So much of what we're doing right now is code language, Jed, where if you said the exact same thing, just using totally different words, <laughs> um, you would actually be very successful. Where uh, if, if you were to go to a very, very conservative voter and say things like, hey, yeah, you know, think drugs are too expensive? They'd be like, yes. Like, hey, you think that we should try and make healthcare more affordable? Like, regardless of your uh, work situation, they'd say, they'd say yes to everything under the sun. Um, and then if you were to say something like, hey, you for Medicare for all, or hey, you for socialized healthcare, then they would say like, no, no, no. In part because they've been trained to say no uh, by Fox News and various uh, radio hosts and the rest of it. Um, uh, and, and so th that's what we've degenerated to where uh, it, it's just each tribe has their own uh, set of buzzwords and cues. And then we, we just uh, react to them very Pavlovian style <laughs> where I was just writing about a collection um, because I'm working on a book right now, very slowly it turns out, but uh, because I have a lot to do right now, but um, but one of the, but one of the the memories was of one of my earlier political speeches in Iowa, where the speaker before me, a senator, a Democratic senator, just kept throwing out slabs of uh, like blue meat to people, and everyone would be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then I'd come up and be like, hey, your malls are closing, uh, you know, Amazon sucking you dry, paying zero in taxes. That ended up actually getting appropriated later as like a, you know, like a buzzword, which, I, you know, I felt good about because I think I, you know, I originated that. Um, but like the, the folks in that tent did not know how to react to me or my buzzwords that were new buzzwords. So they were just like, <laughs> you know? and, and so then after that experience, I'd walk out and be like, did I just stink it up relative to that guy? Like, I didn't think he was that much better a speaker than me, but he got a much better reaction. Um, and so that that was like the, uh, the environment. Um, and you can take that environment and expand it way beyond that tent in Iowa. It was a very big tent. It was like a pretty significant event. Um, but uh, like, like the tents are essentially now the news networks we get our information from or publications. Um, and so each of us now has like a set of um, intellectual cues that we respond to. Uh, and even if you think that you're um, sort of free of this, like you probably aren't because you got to get your news somewhere and you got to hang out with someone. Um, I'm going to point out my good friend, Jed Purdy, for example. So Jed was homeschooled in West Virginia. So he had like, you know, very different background than most of the New England toolboxes we went to prep school with, <laughs> you know, and, and but now Jed's been rattling around uh, the upper echelons of uh, legal academia for a long time. But I suspect Jed still has a much keener sense of what's going on in a lot of communities because, you know, you grow up someplace, uh, it, um, it stays with you. It does stay with you. Um, <clears throat> Andrew, is there, a, is there a way of thinking about, following up on what you were just saying, especially about the way our sort of tribal identities are formed by where we hang out with people and where we get our news, is there a way of thinking about making technology work for people that's about communications technology and democracy. I mean, if you think of Twitter as like a technology that commodifies resentment and helps us to align our identities around basically negative uh, shibboleths, like these, that these are the people we all dislike. And if you think in the Fox News, for example, and the broad, uh, broadcast networks are much more, um, like mid 20th century 
uh, technologies of, of generating a kind of shared political headspace. Like what, what's the technology, if there is such a thing, that um, doesn't lock us into the kinds of divided attitudes that you're describing? Yeah, social media is definitely speeding everything up. Uh, and there's this very, very powerful social media um, and then political media reinforcement loop where every political journalist is on Twitter. Uh, and so then if something gives rise on Twitter, then they'll write an article about it in uh, actual publications uh, and then it drives more social media. Um, so we, we're getting sped up in ways that accentuate what we're talking about in terms of people falling into various um, information bubbles and the rest of it. Uh, and it's very hard to reverse all of this um, because uh, you can't turn back time, frankly. Like you know, you can't just get in a time machine and say, you know, no more, um, no more internet, no more social media in the rabbit. But uh, there are guardrails you could put in place where social media are, are concerned, uh, where it starts to behave a little bit more uh, like some of the earlier mediums um, in some respects. And if you look at it, the government had a much, much a uh, more significant role in a lot of like the early broadcast mediums in terms of uh, radio and TV uh, and cable and the FCC and the rest of it. Um, uh, and the internet, the government's been absent. Government just has been sort of uh, twiddling its thumbs saying, well, the innovators will handle this. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that hasn't gone that great. Uh, you know, we got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment in 1995. Um, this section 230 that everyone's looking at of the you know the communications decency act that was drafted in 96 before facebook even existed and now you have a 650 billion dollar company like operating under like 21 words that no one even freaking like you know could imagine what the world looks like now uh so that's one of the challenges for the folks who are watching this who are part of the law school is uh trying to modernize our legal approach to a lot of these entities uh, and where and some of the big things I wanted to hit, Jed, um, I wanted to hit the like my own experience at Columbia Law, just to share that a little bit. But um, but also we are in this era of institutional decline, um, and uh, there are new institutions that have risen up. So you have like our state institutions, frankly, declining very very quickly, and people losing faith and confidence, and they can't even pass the stimulus bill and um, the rest of it. And then you have these new behemoths that are essentially quasi states at this point. Uh, you know, Facebook has an audience of billions. Uh, it's a, like a $650 billion company last I checked. Amazon's a multi trillion dollar entity, I think, at this point. So then, if you send a government bureaucrat into those offices, like they literally will just like listen to you and just wait for you to shut up and then leave and then just say, absolutely nothing's going to happen. Um, because to them, the government is this impotent source of friction from the past. Uh, and like everyone wants to know, it causes you headaches and some PR things, but it doesn't actually affect their organization's bottom line or success um, because they've never known anything different. Like the last meaningful antitrust action was Microsoft in 98. Uh, and a lot of these firms didn't even exist. So uh, so that's the, the world as it is right now, uh, where you have like the legal regimes and I will say too, as someone, I remember being in law school and studying these Supreme Court rulings and worshiping them as wisdom from on high. And then you see like the, these like hurry up Supreme Court confirmations. And you're like, wait a minute, is someone going to be like pouring over the wisdom of Brett Kavanaugh, like trying to parse like his thinking, like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like the, the institutional uh, decline is deep. Uh, you know, it pains me because I feel like law school is part of, like part of the virtue of law school is that you kind of believe these, these institutions should be functioning. <clears throat> Andrew, how do you think we ought to be thinking about the Supreme Court now? Because it does feel like there's no going back to the idea that all of us were sort of raised on in our law years that the court was, like you said, fundamentally an apolitical repository of timeless wisdom. And I think that there's something to be gained from disenchantment here, right? Because the court over the centuries has been very frequently a tool of um, racial reaction, um, 
oligarchy. It's not by any means been a consistently progressive and it's certainly not been an apolitical institution. So this, we get something from remembering that and not um, swallowing the myth whole. At the same time, we can't live under institutions whose ability to operate is so eroded by warring forms of cynicism that they end up unable to govern. So like, how, how are you seeing the way forward after we've been disenchanted? Maybe we could talk about the court in particular because no one's gonna think that it's nonpartisan or sort of um, transcendent, but we are gonna have to find ways to, to keep living with it. Yes, it's time to abandon the illusions and embrace the new reality. Um, that's that's pretty much my campaign outlook. Yep. <laughs> so we're, we're concerned. Um, abandon all your illusions. So uh, I think we should move to 18-year terms, uh, expand the court, and appoint a new justice every two years, uh, and make it avowedly uh, tied to elections. You win the presidency, you're going to get two justices, uh, and um, people can rotate off in a relatively timely manner. There's no reason why you should be bound to nine. It's just a law passed in 1869. Mm -hmm. You can modernize it. You can do whatever you want. Um, so that would be my take. That is not the Biden administration talking. That's just Andrew Yang talking. Uh, but to, to me, modernization is well overdue. And you could take a similar approach to a lot of things in our government uh, beyond the Supreme Court. Though the Supreme Court is probably the most visible and important right now. Where else would you apply that view? What are the other, what, could give me uh, two or three top illusions that we need to shake off to think productively about government again. So I've been vocal about the fact that it's deeply wrong that we have not passed additional stimulus relief given that one third of American workers have either lost their jobs or had to change job and the vast majority of them have had a reduction in wages. I mean, that's tens of millions of workers. And the fact that we haven't gotten a relief bill passed is one reason why congressional approval nationwide is around 21% pretty low. Um, but the incumbent re-election rate has been 94% over the last several decades. So they look up and say, turns out my interests are better served by uh, sticking with party leadership and just saying, well, it's their fault, uh, rather than trying to get something done that might have helped. Um, so why is that? It's because 80% plus of districts are gerrymandered and safe, or just safe because that's the way it was, like in West Virginia, like didn't matter how you drew it. Uh, or and the fact that uh, they all have these seven figure, maybe even eight figure now moats where they look up and say, you can't really challenge me. I, like I've got the money, like there, there are only so many places you can get money around here. Um, and the party control primaries make it so that all I'm worried about is keeping the most extreme 10% of voters in my district off my back and then I'm set. Uh, so how would you change that? You would have open primaries and then you'd have the, the top five candidates move to rank choice voting, which would give people genuine choice, would make politics much more dynamic, make, make legislators much more accountable, would reduce negative campaigning is if I trash you, we both look bad, number three passes us both. Um, so this would be a way to modernize our elections in a way that would actually make democracy responsive to us. Because right now, again, 21% approval rate, 94% re-election rate, they don't have to listen to us. <laughs> they legitimately can be like, well, you know, I can just blame the side and everything should be fine as long as I keep fundraising. They spend 30 to 70% of their time fundraising. Um, so part of that is uh, campaign finance reform in tandem with those uh, changes to the way we elect legislators. I'm also for term limits. I think it's ridiculous that folks go to DC and just squat there for 30, 40 years. And again, there's like no real accountability or responsiveness. So part of the reason it's hard to make good change um, is that people are so easily turned against it in the tribal terms that you're talking about, oh, right? Oh, and, and I want to talk about too, it's like, if you go to either side, it's like, do you hear about anything I just talked about, like process changes? No, it'd be like, they're bad, here's the red meat or the blue meat. I just made <laughs> up blue meat. It's like the first time I've ever used that term. I don't know if it's going to stick because blue meat sounds kind of gross. <laughs> but <laughs> but no one really has to get that deep into the process because it's just like, look, I'm just going to like keep talking on my issues. Uh, and the most perverse thing is that my incentives might not actually be to solve the problems because right now I can get you pissed off about immigration 
reform or, you know, like immigration abuse or whatever the hell. Um, and then if we come together and have some compromise, then I can't fundraise off it. I can't get you mad about it. I can't animate my base around it. Uh, so that's where we are right now. That's why it feels so bad. People's interests are not in solving problems and there's no real negative repercussion. So I was going to ask you about exactly that. Process reform, to the extent it works, does it make it harder to tribalize politics in the zero sum way that you've been talking about? Give you some foundation to stitch together civic culture a little better? Yes, it would. That's exactly right. Because if you're ranked choice voting, then I need to bring together a broad coalition, even if the crazy person championing the far out idea like universal basic income, <laughs> like like kick it 10% or whatever. Um, though I, I suspect I could break that if I, if I did this again. Um, <laughs> but uh, like you still need to listen to them because it's like, ooh, if I get those 10% into my coalition, that's probably the difference between me and like the second place person. Um, so it, it fundamentally makes it harder just to um, pit us against each other because you actually need to get some more people on your side and you can't win unless you have a real majority. Andrew, can I jump back to something that you said uh, a few minutes ago about what happens when the government bureaucrat comes into the giant tech company and they just sort of wait for him to go? So that's got to be, and I know it's intended to be, sort of depressing to any law student who's kind of thinking about a traditional public this sector. Is the dark, this is the dark thing, Jed. Like half the people listening to this at Columbia Law want to work for the tech company because they know. You know, they, they're like friends. That, they're looking at their friends that they went to fancy schools with. No offense, I went to fancy schools. I went to your school. Um, and are like, hey, I have friends who are working for these places. The food is great. They get paid a lot. They don't seem to have a care in the world. I'm as smart as them. You know, like, like, like I should be angling for like my, my way into like the, the behemoth myself. What am I doing outside like, the, like these walls? You know, and, and, and that's the, I want to retrace a little bit of, uh, of the realities of coming out of a place like Columbia Law. Um, because the, the fact that I, you know, I like have done what I've done uh, was in part a reaction, frankly, to what happened to so many of us, where I graduated from Columbia Law School in 1999. It's a fine economic time. Um, I worked for Davis Polk for four months. Uh, I think, don't think Dean Lester uh, actually defined the, the length of time I was there. <laughs> but um, uh, And the vast majority of the folks from my generation went to Wall Street, went to corporate law firms, went to private equity firms, uh, and the rest of it. Jed here going to academia is like above average. Um, because if you look at like most of my classmates, like, you know, they're... they're um, they're helping make markets work more efficiently would be like the generous way of describing it. <laughs> um, and so then, then uh, you have uh, folks like you coming out of this generation, you're looking around being like, whoa, like what a mess this is. Like, what am I going to do? And in theory, you'd have smart people like you working in the public sector trying to clean it up. Um, but right now, the same forces that drove my friends to Wall Street and corporate law and private equity and the rest of it are going to try and drive you towards probably some of the same industries, probably throw tech in there. Um, uh, you know, um, yeah, I guess it is the same industries plus big tech. I guess, that, you know, things haven't changed that much in uh, a couple of decades. Um, uh, and, and then you have some well-meaning folks who go to the public sector, but the well-meaning folks who go to the public sector, you know what happens to a clean half of them? They get burnt out and jaded and they get sucked up into the private sector. And you can see it very, very clearly where a lot of like the Obama alums, where are they working? Airbnb? You know what I mean? <laughs> like that, that's like that. I mean, that that's what has gone on in our country is because it's difficult to make a stand for something that's non-market driven at this point. And the people at Columbia Law, you are some of the reason I'm here today, aside from my longstanding friendship with Jed, um, the... The second reason I'm here is because the people in this room represent some of the most talented people of your generation. And the question is, are you going to do the things that the market is going to push you to do at every turn, that your peers are going to do at every turn? You're going to look up and say, okay, like this is going to be easier, less resistance, more money, more professional freedom, more everything. Or there's this other stuff you could do that's going to be more of a slog, like uh, more of a thankless brutal, gritty, dirty slog filled with thankless days and lack of money and the rest of it. Um, the vast majority of you are going to choose something in path number one, because that's the way we are designed. We are the meritocrats. We did not kill our ways into Columbia law 
to go work in like penury for years and years. Like that's not the way we are wired. Um, so, so that, <laughs> so that is what we have to change. Like that, this, like this to me is my grand project is trying to make it so that if people do positive things that let's say counteract some of the corruption of the tech companies that they'll have as good and well rewarded monetarily a life as the folks who've been in the, the bowels of those companies for years. And that's a very tall order, but that's my mission. So here are two possible aspects of that, just to keep pressing on how we do this. Um, one is economic change of the kind you've pushed for so that people aren't punished as much for doing work that doesn't generate a return on someone else's investment. At UBI, you could think of as a first step in that direction, like freeing people to take responsibility for their own decisions on terms other than whether they get rewarded or punished in the labor market. And the other side, I would think, would be empowering government in key ways so that, for example, when the antitrust subcommittee sends a letter, Google kind of shakes. Those, because... those two things are very much tied together, Jed, um, because a lot of the great positive projects that we need right now uh, should be led by the public sector. Um, in an ideal world, the Biden administration uh, ends up leading to this more energized public sector that gives rise to uh, long-term projects that can employ people like the folks in this room today in a way that gives you a very, very meaningful and fulfilling and also, you know, like non- um, materially punishing life. Um, uh, and that that's, to me, it's going to be tied to UBI. If there's a UBI in my mind, it's going to be led by the public sector eventually um, uh, as well. Um, so those two things are interrelated, but you're right on both counts. Uh, and and th this is the thing that pains me. I may be living this myself. We'll see. Um, but I, I have many friends. So Jen and I are the same year. And, you know, so we're like in our mid forties, we have good friends who've worked in government for X period of time. Uh, and a lot, again, a lot of them just like came out and ended up in the private sector after. Um, but a lot of the, the really good effective ones went in there and uh, were frustrated, frankly, they got there and they were like, Hey, like, it turns out that I, I can't do a lot of the things that like you kind of hope I could do. Um, we've done a lot of hand tying. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and so what's happened is a lot of the folks who go in public service that are good, that are folks like you, frankly, um, they get frustrated uh, and then they come out, they seek a more efficient environment. And, and they also end up um, perpetuating some of these uh, myths and illusions where they, they kind of still just tell the story, tell the story about all the awesome stuff they did, because that's a much positive story than like, hey, I got frustrated. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And now I'm, you know, working for Carlisle. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, like, like we, we, so we, we kind of still pretend. Um, uh, so I may be living this life pretty quickly because, uh, you know, I, I it, it's um, it, like, I, I obviously joined the Biden administration and the hope is that we can do things both um, for the good and also be really effective and efficient uh, we're going to see. I mean, I, I'm going to see what the possibilities are. So, Andrew, I, I couldn't agree more completely with everything you've just been saying. Um, I know it's hard, it's impossible to predict the political future. And the wave of change that you've helped to create would have been, I think, a great surprise to people who thought that we had solved most of the problems by the late 90s or the early aughts, for example, and that politics was kind of done. <clears throat> but do you ever feel that this might be, these five years or these 10 years might be our last chance for a while, that we're, we might be at a fork in the road where the country risks becoming ungovernable on account of the political pathologies and the market-dominated economic equality that you've been describing that if we don't sort of get it back and start the rebuilding that you're talking about, it may slip out of our grasp. I think that's a very legitimate concern, Jed. Uh, and the, the way that my friend Van Jones says to see things, which I now borrow and tell everyone the same thing, um, is that 
if you're used to thinking about things left versus right, which is the way a lot of people want us to think about things, uh, what you're going to miss is the inside versus outside or the up versus down, where right now there's so much energy among people who don't think that government's actually working, don't think that politicians are actually being driven by whether they can solve our problems, uh, don't believe in a lot of the media, don't, you know, that there's a lot of mistrust. And uh, Trump rode a wave of, of right wing populism and uh, negativity to the White House. Uh, and then on our side, uh, like the progressive side, um, that energy did not win. Um, you know, let's say let's say Bernie represents left wing populism, among um, among others, yeah, among among others, sure. Uh, so that that wing did not win, um, but it was not like a a foregone conclusion. I mean, you know, there there was a contest, um, and that energy is going to grow, not shrink over time, in, unless government really does deliver at a generational level, like at a New Deal type level. In our lifetimes, we have not seen the government deliver at the level they would need to deliver in order to keep this outsider mistrust, disintegration energy from growing. And so when you talk about the five to 10 year window, I agree that if, if hypothetically, and not even hypothetically, because this is going to happen, in my opinion, Joe, Joe is going to be president. Uh, and if nothing big happened, then there'd be this uh, recurring wave that would just keep on crashing in where everything would be a change election. Um, and eventually everyone would just throw their hands up about the whole thing. Um, Philip Howard says that we've been playing a game of you lose, I lose, you lose, I lose. Uh, and the people have been losing the whole time. So eventually the people will look up and be like, wait a minute, like, you know, I'm losing no matter what's going on with you guys. Uh, and that, ha that has been happening for years. Like the lesson from Donald Trump should be that this energy is growing. It's growing on both sides too. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and it's not being accommodated in part because our politics is so stagnant. Uh, it, like in a more dynamic political system, you'd see different types of movements arising like mine frankly. And, mm -hmm. and the more DC insidery you were, the more you thought that Andrew Yang had zero business being in that race. Uh, like, and the more senators and governors and the rest of it that I, I beat, frankly, like the more people had to reckon with it and be <laughs> like, wait a minute, like, how is this guy beating us? Um, and, and no one in that group actually ever would just sit down and compare visions or compare ideas. It's not the way they're wired. They would not look up and be like, Andrew Yang's beating us. Like maybe it's because he's talking about actual things or has a vision or like the rest of it. Like, like that just doesn't compute for them. <laughs> you know? um, so, so that's where we are, Jed. I agree with you. We've got a crucial window of uh, four to eight years. And if we don't do something big, then uh, things are going to continue to get worse, less governable, uh, less integrated, less whole. Uh, I see Jean Lust uh, Dean Lester is back. I am. Um, I've, a number of questions have popped up during this uh, fascinating conversation, and I know that uh, the it's uh, people in the audience are eager to have an opportunity to uh, to hear from you on some of the things that particularly uh, animated them as you've been talking. So let me jump jump in. And uh, there were a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time. So let me let me go with those, and then there are a couple that are on the Q and A. Um, so you were a student at Columbia Law, of course, and um, if you think back to when you were 1L, what would you have done differently? And what advice do you have for students who might want to veer away from traditional practice? You spoke passionately about it, but so how do you, uh, how do you stay the course? Uh, and, and how do you veer away from the, you know, the inexorable pull, uh, even when you don't really know what you want to do? I went straight to law school. So I was 21 as a 1L. I was young. Um, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just wanted to do well um, in, in classes. Uh, I summered at a corporate law firm and the rest of it. Um, I think that as a 1L, just getting used to law school and, and figuring out what legal, uh, like, legal acad academics look like, I think is probably uh, a lot. Um, I think the rubber starts hitting the road in your 2L year, like after you've been settled and then you can start looking around. Um, I'm going to say something controversial, but like I don't think that law school 
actually fills your time up that much in the second and third year. The second and third year, you could do other things. Um, and, and so my guidance would be to try to nail down whatever is in front of you in terms of, you know, like get good grades and do the rest of it, um, have some good experiences. And then in, in your second year, start trying to figure out what other types of orgs uh, you might have an interest in and then put some time in. Uh, and you are, you'd be a law student at one of the top law schools in the country. Any organization where that's all would want your time if you're going to be genuine about it and actually try and deliver for them in a real way. Um, most law students don't do that because uh, most law students look up and say, well, my incentives, you know, certainly first year, the re reason I'm not pressing on first year is your incentives first year just to get good grades, frankly. Um, but then starting your second year, you can start to be a little bit more flexible and, and put your head up. So if you're interested in startups, for example, just start pinging startups and some of your friends and be like, hey, can I do something to help? And then if you make yourself genuinely helpful, um, then you might end up with an opportunity that way. That's actually what happened to me over time. Well, let me, let me segue from that to politics. Um, uh, one of the people who asked a question is Rachel Polly, who's our director of government programs. And she's asking on behalf of the many, many students who over the years have, have routinely come to her and asked how they get into politics. They, they're interested in running for office or joining political campaigns, but they don't really know what the pathway is into being able to, uh, to do, uh, to, you know, to run. So what advice do you have for students who want to get into politics? And, I, and, and I'm going to put a finer point on this, especially first generational profession, first generation professionals or students of color. You'll, you'll be happy to know that you've done something that actually sets you up very, very nicely to run for office if, if you want to. Because uh, if you come out of Columbia Law and do uh, legal work, whether it be at a firm or in another environment, people will actually think of that as qualification to run for office. And you'll end up in a network of folks who can donate uh, one to $2,000 each to your campaign, um, which let's say you're running for office in New York. I think there's a six to one match for city offices. So if you could get together a um, hundred friends to give you a thousand dollars each, which you might be able to do if you were to even work in a law firm in New York City, um, then you'd end up with $600,000 pretty quickly that you could run on. And that's just New York City because the six to one match doesn't apply everywhere. Um, but I will say this is a layup question because if you want to run for office, all you have to do is practice law in any context uh, and start getting involved in local politics, and then people will look at you as a potential candidate in no time. When I, when I say no time, I mean five to 10 years, <laughs> because no one looks up and is like, this 25 year old should run. So if you wanna run at that age, then you're gonna to have to be a lot more aggressive and ambitious. You have to pull an Andrew Yang, you just have to say, I'm doing it. Um, but if you practice for five to 10 years, you'll be seen as a potential political candidate in that time period. I got a question that um, that taps into the, the sort of the final the final point in that last question about uh, students of color. Um, there are some students who've asked about your identity as an Asian American and uh, the extent to which that affected your decision to run for president. And more broadly, uh, here's another question about the moment. Um, what do you see as the role for Asian Americans in social justice movements like Black Lives Matter? Uh, I will confess to you all that one reason I ran for president was because I thought I could get on the debate stage and that having an Asian American face on the debate stage would be very, very positive uh, for kids who grew up the same way I did, where I was first generation in this country. And I thought that would be enormously uh, positive for the Asian American community. Uh, because seeing someone like, like me on TV would have made me very happy when I was a kid growing up, or, or even a bit older, not even a kid, um, really at any point. Uh, so I'm very proud of, of being the first Asian American man to run for president uh, as a Democrat, and I hope that people in our community found it uh, invigorating. Uh, I think Asian Americans should be helping with Black Lives Matter. I, I'm pro-affirmative action myself. Uh, I think Asian Americans need to have very, very uh, clear uh, ways to engage with different communities that are not ourselves. Um, and so... Anytime Asian Americans stick up for another community, I think it's enormously positive. And if we can do that for Black Americans who've been uh, treated inhumanly and brutally, then that would be good for the entire country, not just good for Black Americans in our community. Uh, 
to me, a lot of this is just about trying to represent values as human beings. And any human being should be angry uh, and distressed by what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery. And you can just go on and on. Um, so if you feel that way as a human being, then we should feel that way as a community. So I have some questions about um, your technique in politics. Uh, this is a question that comes from Jen Taylor, who uh, was one of your regional organizing directors in the New Hampshire primary. Really? Hey, and Jen, what's so she's going on? There. <laughs> That's incredible. So she said one of the aspects of the campaign that impressed her the most was the effectiveness of your messaging toward Obama Trump voters. Uh, what do you think made your messaging so successful and what can the Biden campaign and future Democratic candidates learn from you about connecting to these voters? Thank you for your help, uh, Jen. It makes me so happy that you're here. Um, in January, someone ran a survey that said that 42% of my voters did not think they were gonna support the Democratic nominee. Um, so there was like a lot of crossover energy in my campaign. And I think there were a number of reasons for that. One, I think was my unconventional background. There are a number of Trump supporters who are just kind of uh, sour on politicians. <laughs> so they kind of liked me. Um, but I think another reason why people liked me, um, and I think they liked Obama for some of the same reasons, is that I never brought a sense that I was judging anyone uh, or looked down on anyone. Um, you know, it's like if someone disagreed with me or voted for Trump, uh, I mean, I have family members who voted for Trump, you know, so like, I, I'm certainly not going to um, stand here and try and uh, castigate tens of millions of Americans for a uh, uh, political uh, figure they supported. And I think if you bring kind of energy to politics, then you can appeal to more people. A lot of Americans just want to feel like you're listening to them, you care about them, and you'll stick up for them. And they do not believe that of most political figures right now. So if you can convince them that you're genuine, then you can reach a lot of disaffected Americans. So there are a couple of questions here about some of the obstacles that you talked about when, uh, when uh, you and Professor Purdy were, were chatting. And I'm gonna take two questions. That's what we called him in high school, Professor Purdy. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to smush a couple of questions together with apologies to those who asked the questions, but you'll see why they're related. So, uh, so one of them um, raises the, some of the changes you advocate for, like enacting ranked choice voting um, that would require members of Congress and our current political institutions to act against their own apparent and immediate self-interest. And another question I'm going to add is a student um, Andrew from, uh, sorry, a, a student, um, Satyan from Andrew's, uh, from who's asking you, Andrew, from Jed Purdy's class about things that he, he learned about in constitutional law, about um, big barriers uh, that create an anti-democratic stra uh, um, strain in the constitution, like the electoral college, the structure of the Senate, the lack of proportional representation. So both are describing you know, behavioral and structural impediments to change. And they're throwing their hands up and saying, help us through understanding how we would really bring about change with- All that. right, all right. The doctor is in. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, so right now, uh, ranked choice voting is on the ballot next week in Massachusetts and Alaska. It's been used in Maine. The great thing is that it's actually up to states how they conduct these elections. And uh, there are a number of states that like Massachusetts that have ballot initiatives where if you just get a bunch of people together in a, in a state and say, we should have ranked choice voting, we should have open primaries. Um, California switched to, to open primaries with the final two, which I think is too small, but this is not something that members of Congress even need to sign off on. This is something that, so if you live in a state and you get enough people excited about this, uh, and there'll be a lot of excitement in your state as soon as people figure it out, because there's no good reason to be against ranked choice voting. You look up and say, wait a minute, more choice, no one can bully me for quote unquote wasting my vote, uh, uh, less negative campaigning, like sign me up. Um, so we can make it happen without Congress buying in happily. Um, the, the stuff in the constitution about the electoral college uh, and the Senate and a bunch of other things. So we have some very, very densely populated areas in this country that you're in. Um, and then we have some very, very rural areas like the areas Jed grew up in. 
Um, and the fact is, if you were to just do it based on population, people like me would never go anywhere near West Virginia or Iowa or Kansas or a bunch of like, I would just hang out in major media markets. Um, so there's like a tempting proposal to be like, well, pure democracy, just make everyone's vote the same. Like, is it, shouldn't my vote be the same as uh, someone in Montana? And there's something very beautiful and elegant about that, but we have to face facts that the framers of the constitution decided to do it a little differently. They decided to do it regionally in a particular way. So what we should be arguing for, in my opinion, is proportional allocation of electors on a per state level. And the reason why this is such a home run is that no one in uh, 40 states loves the fact that they get ignored every four years because they don't live in Ohio, Michigan, Florida, uh, New Hampshire, like the other swing states, you know, it's like they want some love too, and they don't want just to be hit up for money. So it, it might make sense for me to campaign in uh, Arkansas or Mississippi or someplace, certainly Texas, if I thought I could move the margin of victory uh, in one direction and get another actor or two. So this is the kind of reform that everyone should be on board with, where you can look up and say, look, this is something that vast majority of states would be for. Because it doesn't help us to get mad at the Electoral College when it would require Nebraska and a bunch of other places to essentially throw away their electoral power, which isn't, isn't happening. Because you all saw in your con law class, like, well, you need a constitutional amendment for that. You need a supermajority. And you would never get 15 states to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, so proportional allocation, uh, ranked choice voting, like these things are actually feasible, even given the system we have, uh, because they would help most Americans uh, to the last point they made, which is that a lot of people in Congress are not going to be for these changes. You're right. That's that's a difficult one. I even have a, a sneaky way we can get term limits enacted. Check it out. Um, term limits for all members of Congress, but current members are exempt. No skin off their back. It's just going to apply to the people that come after them. Uh, so, But eventually they would phase out, not even that long a time, and then you'd have a different composition, a different modernity, different dynamism, different motivations, different incentives. Uh, so Andrew Yang's always trying to figure out what you can get done uh, in the world we live in. Um, and, and I get frustrated with the folks who, frankly, like, again, gin us up on things that have no chance of happening in reality. So um, question about low resource communities. Uh, many low resource communities are not as involved in our political fabric because of the immediate needs that their families and lives require. How do you think we can eliminate these barriers between this large percentage of Americans um, outside UBI considering the uphill battle of its implementation? Well, again, UBI majority approval going up all the time. So, uh, you know, it's like, I, I would not concede that that's actually not a practical way to go. There are dozens of mayors around the country who are launching pilots from uh, LA to Atlanta to St. Paul uh, to Newark. Like it's everywhere. It's not just an Andrew Yang thing. Uh, you know, uh, so we're going to get UBI passed. Uh, but the other big way we can activate these communities, and I said this on the trail, is to have everyone have hundred democracy dollars you can give every year. And, and th this has shown that um, black families in um, Washington state uh, all of a sudden said, wait a minute, I get a hundred free dollars that I can, I can give. And Americans love feeling like they're investors and things, you know, then all of a sudden they start scratching their chin being like, hmm, who am I going to get behind? Um, and that should be something that we can all be excited about because it, it's energized, excuse me, our democracy. Um, so there, there are fundamental inequities in our society that make it harder for women to run, harder for people of color to run. And it's one reason why a lot of marginalized communities do not pay attention to politics, because I'm going to just lay it out. Politics is an affluent American's pursuit. Uh, and so if you are poor in this country, you think my vote doesn't matter. I certainly can never run. They actually don't care about me. Uh, and that's what most of them think, not most, but a significant proportion, like in it's higher in some communities. Um, and the, the thing you'd have to look at and say to, to them is like, how can I actually demonstrate that you are incorrect? Like the, because it's not highly, it's not entirely irrational on their side. Uh, you know, like, like that, that's, again, this is like the, the end of illusions, this period. Um, like, it's not entirely irrational for them not to pay attention to politics. Uh, and so how do you make it rational for them to do so? Okay, I'm gonna, I've got one minute and I'm gonna um, 
ask four popcorn questions. And what I mean by that is, you know, a question, some of them might be weighty questions, but if you can just answer in a sentence, then we can um, hear some quick thoughts on a few things. Okay. Uh, what do you think are the most important skills for a lawyer to have in the future? Well, wow, as you can tell, I'm reflecting on this. Um, <laughs> for a lawyer, um, I, I think it would be the ability to um, see things from um, different points of view, including, um, so the obvious ones, like you have to know the law, then you have to be able to see your client's interests um, and their business interests. If you can figure that out, then you can become higher value add. And if you can see that, then you actually become um, more versatile where you can do different kinds of roles beyond being a lawyer. So that's why I was struggling. I was like, well, like it's going to make it sound like I should not be a lawyer anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I'm pro versatility. So, that, the, so that's what I would say. It's like the, the best lawyers in my mind are going to be able to see business issues. Thoughts on packing the court? I'm pro modernization of the Supreme Court, which would involve more than nine justices. Uh, what can I do if I want to go work for you? Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. It sounds like there's some people here who have worked for my campaign. Um, uh, my organization, Humanity Forward, is doing great work. So if you end up uh, helping us on a volunteer level, um, that'll be great. There aren't that many folks um, who are doing awesome work. So uh, you could end up working at Humanity Forward. Um, yeah, if, if you just keep after Humanity Forward and me, like we'll probably end up taking you on at some point if you're awesome, frankly, because there aren't that many awesome people. Um, so that that's part of it is like, if you know you're awesome, you should know that you can get yourself to the place you want to be because there are just not that many great people. Uh, and so if you're great, we'll figure it out. It might take us a minute, but you have a massive thing going for you is that you're going to have this giant badge called Columbia Law School that will give people a big clue that you're great. I hate to say it. That's like a dark reality or maybe a light reality because considering that you're all badge holders. Uh, so yeah, like it's, it's not going to be very hard for you to get it with us over time if you want it. Okay, I'm going to end on this final question. Um, this is a time of deep polarization and anger. Uh, how do we keep our humanity and our compassion in these times? I love this question so much. Um, and it's something that I, I struggle with myself. Columbia Law School is a fantastic intellectual training ground. It draws some of the most talented people in the country. Um, but it, it will lead you in directions that make it harder to uh, retain some of this humanity you're talking about, in my experience, in my opinion. Um, and so the, the ways you retain your humanity, uh, one would be experience nature. There's just something fundamental about it. Like if you just get out of uh, urban environments and get away from people, uh, interact deeply with folks that are not like you, uh, because now you are part of a very rarefied tribe. Um, and if you manage to interact with folks that are not like you uh, in a way that actually touches you, uh, then that will help you preserve your humanity um, and the, the third thing is just to find something that you believe in and stand for that the market detests. Uh, and, and the market hates a lot of things now, so it should not be very hard. Uh, like the market hates preserving our environment. The market hates mental health. <laughs> the, the market hates caring for uh, kids. The market hates single mothers. The market hates a lot of things. So just find one thing that you believe in that the market does not like and it will help preserve your humanity. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for that last set of comments, uh, particularly, uh, but I also want to thank you for the time you took to spend with us. Uh, a thoughtful interesting discussion, especially at this busy time leading up to the election. So uh, thank you, Andrew Yang, for being with us. Thank you, for, uh, Jed Purdy, for uh, kicking us off with a great, great conversation that uh, was thoughtful on both sides. And I also want to just thank uh, our whole audience. Uh, I know that if we were in a big auditorium, which I know would have been packed to the gills and into a break of uh, spillover rooms, 
you would have heard the applause through the room and out into the halls. And so uh, here on Zoom, you can't hear much applause, but I'm going to just say it on behalf of all of us that it was a thrill to have you. And, um, and we just, on behalf of all of us at Columbia, thank you so much. Thank you thank so much, Andrew. You. Thank Good you, Jed. Everybody. Thank you, Dean Lester. Thank you, Columbia Law. What you do is hugely important because you are me and Jed X years from now. <laughs> so, so make it count. Take yourself seriously. You're going to be us in no time. And then me and Jed will be like the old fogies being like pointing at you being like, you are my student. <laughs> that was Jed talking, obviously, not me. Thank you all. Have a great all right. night. We're going to win this thing. We're going to win this thing next week. The question is, what then? All right. Good night. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you all.